This morning we're beginning session 18, and uh, I got an email this week I thought was kind of hilarious. This guy wrote me and he said, he said, I don't know what it is about this Understanding the Kingdom series, but I guess he was also ex-military, but he said as you were praying and, and, and speaking and, and preaching, he said, something on the inside of me woke up. And he said, it's like I got a spiritual shot of testosterone. And he says, just keep preaching this series. He says, I don't care if you get to episode 357, just keep preaching the series. And that's what I'm going to do. I've, I've decided that this thing has basically taken a life of its own. I was originally going to use this for more material for the book, but we're covering so much stuff, guys. This would be a 15-volume series <laughs> if I tried to write it all down, although I am going to be taking things like what we dealt with with the Jericho Wall last week. That's making it into the book. It's got to be there. But this morning, as we're progressing through the Word of God, uh, I began thinking when I, I, I remember, now you may not, for me, I didn't pay a lot of attention to it before I was called to ministry, but I was also called at a very early age. I was 13. Um, in fact, it was my 13th birthday when I surrendered to preach. And it's kind of like my bar mitzvah. Mazel tov. Um, but I became very aware after that because you're, my, my pastor, in fact, uh, I, I remember this quite well. Now, for those that watch our videos may not be able to understand this, but my first message was about three and a half minutes on Sunday morning. And I studied a week for it, and I was preaching on the end times, and I let them have it for a whole three and a half minutes. Uh, at 13, I think that was pretty good. No training. The pastor says, you're called to, you're called to preach. You preach next Sunday. Uh, the fear of God hit me, and I, I, I didn't sleep at night. All these different things. But I, I became conscious of the fact that everybody kept on talking about we need to return to a Book of Acts church. Has anybody ever heard that over the years? But at the same time, their understanding of a Book of Acts church is basically their church set in the Book of Acts. And so for some, it's a Baptist church. For some, it's a Pentecostal church. For some, it's a Seventh-day Adventist church. They all try to, to simply take what, where they're at and set it and call that the New, the New Testament church that we see in the book of Acts. But when you actually look at the book of Acts in its historic context, it was a spirit-filled Hebraic church that did several things. It knew the Torah very well. It also understood the dynamic of Mystery Babylon and the pagan religions and it was able to separate the two. That is something that where we're at right now, we can't do. And so I'm, I'm praying and I'm meditating, and I've done this actually for years. Uh, God, help return us to that Book of Acts church, that Book of Acts church. And so I'm, I'm expecting the Holy Spirit to take me to the Book of Acts, you know, so that I can begin studying. In fact, I had, I had kind of determined one time I was going to write a commentary on the Book of Acts. And there was just no traction to it. I guess it's because I had to write the Shiner Directive and some of the other things that I'm writing. But it's like it gained no traction. There was an uneasiness in my spirit about it. The anointing just wasn't there. But what over the years the Holy Spirit has consistently done is when I try to go to the book of Acts, he takes me to the book of Judges. And I look at that and say, what is the deal? Now, one of the things that helps is when you have a prophetic wife. Many people don't realize that a lot of the things that I teach are because Mary heard the initial thing in prayer, as she, and, and, it, and when she says something, it sparked a whole chain of things, and I begin to research. And so we're a good tag team. Either God will show me something or show her something, and we, 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 we really, our, our anointings feed on each other. And so God was doing the same thing with her. And she shared with me, she said, I think where we're headed is something like the book of Judges. And so here I am, the Holy Spirit's taking me, my wife's talking about the book of Judges. And I begin to realize where we're at, guys, so mirrors the book of Judges in the last days that it is uncanny. Now I need to set the historical setting. The book of Judges is after the time of Joshua. Now, before Moses 
And, and really, Moses is pretty awesome. Now, some, some commentators try to dismiss the very last part of Deuteronomy because Moses is closing out Deuteronomy, and he actually writes out the scene that he's going to go up to the mountain and die and, and, and everything. And he writes it all out before he dies. And, and, and some more liberal uh, commentators said, well, that was filled in probably Joshua. Somebody wrote that to help finish out the book because it's like, I'm getting ready to go to the mountain, and that's it. <laughs> No, it wasn't. He was prophetic enough that he knew. But before he died, he handed them one copy of the completed Torah. Because he completed Deuteronomy right before he died. And so they have, there's one copy in existence, that's it. And in that cycle, he said, here's what you're going to do, Israel. Wherever the Lord gathers you, God is going to pick a place that three times a year you gather during those feast times. Passover, Shavuot, and during the day of, uh, of atonement. And when you come, you're going to hear the word read to you, the commandments of God read to you. So they only heard the word three times a year. That's it. Now, God had established the Levitical order, and the Levite's job was to teach them the Torah. But how many know that even in the day of Judges, a Levite couldn't run around and pull out his copy of the Torah and read it? It was a precious thing. There were only a few copies. And so they were having to do it from memory, which ne is not necessarily a bad thing, but how many know there is an anointing when you read the Word of God that gets deep on the inside of you? Now, we, we see in the, in the, within the Jewish tradition, now the Apostle Paul, before he entered into the school of Hillel, he had already memorized the Torah. You could, you could start a passage. Now, back then, they didn't have the addresses like we do. But each Torah portion had a name. And so if you gave him that name, he could quote that entire Torah portion to you because he had memorized it. We don't know if in the day of Judges, the Levites had done that or not. But there was a scarcity of the word. And when there is a scarcity of the word and the understanding of the word, you can preach and teach anything you want, and there's no counter to it because people can't open up and say, thus saith the Lord. Okay? But one of the things that really stuck out in this, it stuck in, you kind of see this after Judges 17, it begins to be repeated over and over and over again. Now listen to see if this doesn't sound like what we're dealing with today. Uh, Judges 17 and 6. In those days there was no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Now, I know this is the infallible word of God. At the same time, I have contention with this verse because there was a king. His name was Yahweh Elohim. Okay. So I want to deal, first of all, with the king issue of the kingdom. Now, there are, there are branches that say that they're Christianity today that go back to Rome in which there is a throne. And when the pope is consecrated to become a pope, he is enthroned. In fact, when a bishop or an archbishop is installed, it's called an enthronement. And what's horrible, that, as from my perspective, is now in evangelical Christianity, we're having you know, people becoming bishops and archbishops. And, and I saw one guy, he was a super archbishop slash super apostle or something or other, you know. And when they installed him, it was called an enthronement, very different than an ordination. That comes out of Roman Catholicism, and as far as they're concerned, the Pope's throne in Rome is the throne of Christ in the earth. I'm still protesting that. I have no king but Jesus. Okay? 
But when God set up the nation of Israel, he set it up as a theocracy. In fact, when you really set it in context, you have this king come da- comes down and uses a servant. Moses was an apostle. Because he was one, that's what an apostle means, one sent, one commission, sent with a purpose. So Moses was an apostle. Abraham is considered a prophet. He walked with God, talked with God, and, and, and God led him and, and began giving promises to him. And so when the, you know, when the apostle Paul says our faith is built upon the, the apostles and prophets, in his mind he's not thinking of his generation, he's thinking of Moses and Abraham and Elijah, and the kings, the true kings of Israel like David, that our faith is based on that. And so he goes down, he delivers a people, he establishes them at a nation around his throne as a vassal nation. There's a greater kingdom, he's creating a lesser kingdom here, and so the ruling king, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, is ruling over a vassal nation. That's one of the reasons, in fact, there's, there, to this day, because we do not have the original Ten Commandments, we don't know, some, you know, some speculate you had the first five, which is your service toward God, you have the second five, which is your service toward another, an, others. But when you look back at that time period when a greater king would come and s- liberate a people, he would, he would create these rules and he would create two copies. One was to be kept with the people and one was ever to be kept in his court so that he could see the promises and the regulations that he had made with those people. But since the Ark of the Covenant was his throne upon the earth, both sets were set in the Ark of the Covenant. So we have this, we have this vassal nation paradigm where God says, I want to be your king and here's my rules. He was trying to set up the kingdom of God over the top of a physical kingdom. But somehow or another, because they were disconnected from the word, whatever, the, whatever was going on in Israel, they did not have the leadership of Joshua. They forgot they had a king. And they began to demand an earthly king. Kind of sounds like a lot of nations and a lot of churches today, doesn't it? We want someone to rule over us. One of, the, one of the, the conundrums Mary and I have in ministry, and this has been going on for a couple of decades, everybody wants to come and let us tell them what to do. Tell me how to fix it. Tell me how to do it. No, my job is to get you free so that you can hear from God so that you can begin fixing it. Because the truth of the matter is, you were listening to another spirit that caused you to create the problem. So my job is to get you free so that you can start listening to the Holy Spirit to walk yourself out of that problem. And then you have a testimony that can be replicated in the life of anyone. Okay? But God knew that they were, they were going to want to be like the world. Does that kind of sound like the church today too? Now in Deuteronomy 17, I want you to look this up. I am going to get a sip of my coffee here in a minute. I'm too busy preaching to enjoy my cup of coffee. Deuteronomy 17, 14. God tells him, now you're getting ready, you know, when you come into the land, stuff's going to happen. It says, And when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, and shall possess it, and shall dwell therein, and shalt say, I will set a king over me like all the nations round about me. I want to be like the world. They're making fun of me because I don't have a king. Yes, you do. His name is Yahweh Elohim. But I want a physical king. I want to be like everybody else when you were called to be a separate nation, a separate people. That were to be, you were to be self-governing by the commands of the king that set you free. But that wasn't enough. We got we to be like everybody else. And he goes on to say in verse 15, Thou shalt in any wise set a king over thee, whom the Lord thy God shall choose, one from among Thy brethren shalt thou set 
uh, shall thou set king over thee, that thou mayest not set a stranger over thee, which is not thy brother. And actually the founding fathers of America actually used this verse in Deuteronomy to set that you had to be not someone who came in and became a citizen of the United States to be president, but you had to be native born. You had to be born an American, just like you had to be born an Israelite to become a king. And so God said, listen, and there's really some neat things that when you go down, none of the kings of Israel really did. He said, now king, you're not going to increase yourself in horses. You're not going to draw all this wealth to you. You're not going to tell them to go back to Egypt or trust in Egypt. You are not to have multiple wives. And you have to write in your own hand. That king had to write in his own hand as after he became king, he was tutored and he had to write in his own hand the Torah. And so then he had to read the commandments and instruction of God in his own handwriting the rest of his life. In fact, some rabbis speculate that Solomon left out one little, I think it was one little yod in the line that says, where thou shalt not have multiple wives, so that his Torah scroll could read, thou shalt have multiple wives. And they talk about how that yod went up and complained before God because that one little, one little, jot, one little tittle was missing in the mind of, of Solomon, and look what it did. The wisest man before Jesus became the most perverse at the end because of what strange women, wine, women, and song, took down Solomon. It's taken down a lot of preachers today, by the way. Um, but we see ourselves in a similar situation. We were in bondage to the Pharaoh of this world. Jesus came and set us free. In the Old Testament, we had the progression of Moses and Joshua. In the New Testament, we had the early church and the early apostles that were handpicked and trained by Jesus to include the Apostle Paul because the Apostle Paul was taken up into the third heaven and taught by Jesus himself. So even the Apostle Paul was trained by Jesus. We have that, but now we have so gone way, way past that that we think we have no king. In fact, right now in the body of Christ, we're being preached because of grace. There is no king. I am not answerable to God for the way that I live because I've got the cross. Ha, ha, ha. And I can be whatever I want to be because I have no king and I can do whatever's right in my own eyes because of grace. You're deceived. You see, the truth is, if there is a king, and he has a law, the cross of Christ did not change sin. It changed me and my desire to sin. I was not set free from the Torah. I was set free from the power of sin which flows from the heart of the devil so that I could actually walk in the ways of God because at the new birth, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit wrote the commandments of God on the inside of my heart and that wasn't enough. He then moved into me to help teach me and tutor me to begin walking in those commandments. And one of the reasons Christians are having this dichotomy all along in their lives is their heads are not matching up with their hearts. The preaching is, there is no king. Every man can do what's right in his own eyes as long as it preaches really well and it builds a big church and we can have a big ministry and be on TV. I can preach anything I want because we're living in a day where men will pay to have other men tickle their ears with the doctrines of Mystery Babylon. But how many know that we're, getting, we're, we're wrapping this thing up? I don't think we got another 2,000 years. We may not have another 20 years. I don't know. But Jesus is coming back. And we're going to have to give an answer to him. You see, we do have a king. Paul in 1 Corinthians says there is the judgment seat of Christ. Judgment seat. The king will judge you. Not for your sin, but for your life. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. This is in my notes, but I, I want to I show this. Let's 
starting in 1 Corinthians 2 and 11. Now see what the Apostle Paul is teaching here is something that you learn with all three of the feasts of the feast seasons when you appear before the Lord. There is a concept you all you never, never, never appear before the Lord empty handed. You bring an offering with you. How many know that you cannot bring your MasterCard or Visa with you when you go to heaven? Your worldly cash doesn't mean a thing. You can't even put gold and silver in your pockets and take it there. The only thing that you can appear before the Lord with is your life. Okay? So we pick up here in... Let's go up to verse 10. According to the grace that was given unto me as a, wide ma as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, another built thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than what that, that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. And he's, ta he's talking about our own lives. Now, if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble, every man's works, every man's work, every man's work, but brother, I don't have to do work to be saved. No, you don't. But once you get saved, how about getting off of God's welfare and start working in the kingdom? Come on now. I am tired of hearing people say, that isn't what i got to do to be saved. Well, get saved and start getting kingdom conscious. Once you're birthed into the kingdom, the Bible says, in the, the, Paul said in Ephesians, that we were recreated unto good works. So who's right, Paul or you? He did not say you were create, recreated in Christ Jesus to come down, sit on your blessed assurance, and coast your way into heaven. Now he's telling those in the Corinth church that when you appear before the Lord, the work that you did after you got saved is going to be judged by Jesus. That ought to put the fear of God in all of us. I'm sorry, Lord, my life didn't mean anything because I was too busy living for Babylon to do anything for you. Or I was taught once saved, always saved. Ha, 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 I'm hearing anything you can do about it. Well, first of all, if you had that attitude, you're probably going to go to the express elevator down when you die. Because you're really not saved because anybody that's really been born again, they have the want to, has, is, it was embedded in their spirit the moment they got saved, but the theology around them teaches them that they don't have to. Guys, we're supposed to roll up our sleeves after we get saved and get busy about our Father's business, just like Jesus. Look what it says here in verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by what? By fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so by fire. There's going to be some people, they got saved when they were five, and allowed God to do absolutely nothing in their life from that point forward. They came, they read the word, they sat on a pew, they wrote out a tithe check and said, I've got it made, I've got my golden ticket, I'm going to get in, there's nothing we can do about it. And we have missed the point. We have preached grace so much about being saved, we have forgot that God has also given us grace to live in the kingdom. And so when they get there, their, their entire life is placed before the throne of God. The fire of the Holy Spirit descends on that, and when, it's, when He is done, there's nothing left. So your life meant nothing for the kingdom. But there will be, you see, the thing is, gold, silver, and precious stones, the hotter the fire, the more pure they become. And then you receive a reward. Well, what do you do with that reward? Well, we find in the book of Revelation that reward becomes a crown. What are crowns made out of? 
gold, silver, and precious stones. And so now you get into heaven, your life is now a crown upon your head, guess what you get to do with it? Are you strutting around heaven saying, just look at my bling? Come on, my crown's bigger than yours! <laughs> no. We're too busy taking the crowns of what Jesus did in our life and casting them at his feet and worshiping him with them. The last thing I want to do is get to heaven and have nothing in my hands to worship Him with. Because the only thing that we send ahead of us is how we walk in the kingdom once we're saved by grace. That grace now enables us to walk in the ways of God, constantly crucifying the flesh and walking in the new man. Because, guys, we do have a king. But guys, people aren't acting like we do. They have no respect. There are, now guys, now, and I want to, when I'm talking about this, and I want to make this real clear. There are many faithful servants of Almighty God. You know, there's sometimes people like me, we can, we can feel like, you know, Elijah in the cave saying, oh, woe is me, I'm the only one left preaching and teaching the truth. And God's got to remind you, oh yeah, I have a whole lot of other faithful prophets that have not bowed the knee to Baal. And let me tell you something, if you have a pastor, if you have a spiritual leader that is faithfully saying, thus saith the Lord, and teaching the word, and refusing to bow to Babylon, refusing to bow to the, word, to the world, then you need to do exactly what the Apostle Paul said and give him double honor. Quit badgering him and start giving him the time that he needs to get before God and get in the word. Many pastors don't have the time to pray and get in the word and do all the research necessary because they're too busy wiping sheep's noses. There comes a time where sheep get old enough to wipe their own noses. Oh, that's a whole nother can of worms, isn't it? The other issue we have in the time of Judges is that the Word of God was really scarce. In fact, what amazes me is now in those days it was the Levites' duty to teach throughout the communities. They did not have an inheritance. They did not have a land. They were to embed themselves within the community now, those communities were still forming and established them, and as they would begin to teach the people the ways of God, they received the tithe, which helped fund their families and everything, because they're, they're, it goes all the way back to Melchizedek, you always tithe to where you're spiritually fed. Because when Melchizedek came to Abraham and taught him the mystery of the bread and the wine, Abraham tithed. 10% of everything that he had to Melchizedek. So there's a direct connection there. But when, when I, I pulled up Bible Works this morning, and I said, okay, I want to know all the occurrence of Levite in the book of Judges. One guy. Only one Levite is even mentioned in all the book of Judges. And he's a guy wandering around because he's not found a place to where he could teach, and he doesn't have anything to eat, he doesn't have any money, he doesn't have anything, because his inheritance, if you will, comes from teaching the Word. And he finds this guy named Micah. Now what Micah did, is Micah takes all the gold, or the, all the silver, if you will, that his uh, mother had dedicated, in fact it was, it was 1,100 shekels of silver, that she had dedicated to the Lord. It was kind of like Jericho. It was a, a cursed thing. You, you couldn't use it for yourself. You could only use it for God. And, and Micah thought, you know what? I'm coming back to my mom's house. I'm getting that silver. And he made an idol with it and created a house for that idol. He even consecrated his own son to be a priest over that idol. He created an ephod and things like the high priest had for the worship of that idol. And so now you have this Levite coming through. And, and Micah goes up to him and says, listen, I'm going to give you silver. I'm going to give you clothes, and I'm going to feed you. You can stay in my house if you'll come and minister to include ministering to my idol. And the Levite said, 
Sure. Where was the Levites say, you can't do that. You are not allowed in the commandments of God to have that. It must be destroyed and that golden idol, that silver idol melted down and it was dedicated for God. You better give it to the God's treasury. None of that was done. New clothes, food on the table, money in my pocket. Later on, this Levite gets a wife or a concubine. Sounds like a pretty good deal to me. How many today in the body of Christ, we are, we are living in a time of the judges and don't even know it. That so many that are supposed to be preaching and teaching the word of God have aligned themselves with the idols of Babylon because it put clothes on their back, put food in their bellies, and gave them silver in their pockets. I cannot find anywhere in the book of Judges where a Levite came and said, Thus saith the Lord, God had to raise up judges. And here's how this story went. See if this sounds familiar. We go along, we're violating the Word of God. We go along, we're violating the Word of God. Then we end up having judgment, and so we now have somebody lording over us. We're now in bondage, and the bondage gets worse, and the bondage gets worse, and the bondage gets worse. We cry out. God sends a deliverer, a judge, gets us free. When we get free, we go back exactly to what we were doing before. Oh, come on now. We go back to exactly what we were doing before, violate the Word of God, being completely ignorant of this. Guys, we don't understand in the 21st century, the great blessing that we have of being able to have the Word of God and carrying it with you. Not only do I have the Word of God and carrying it with me, but with my little MacBook or whatever computer you use, not only I have the Word of God not only in 10 or 15 translations, in the original Greek and Hebrew, I have about 8,000 volumes from my library I can carry with me and research at a moment's notice. And if you say, I can't afford that, go get eSword, which is free, and then go to BibleSupport.com, and you can download literally entire libraries and install on that thing for free. And you can research to your heart's content. But we don't have time to research because we're too busy being the Laodicean church that we use commercialism we use materialism we use finances to mimic spirituality and it has gotten to the place to where if you're rich you have to be blessed of god and therefore you are spiritual tell that to elijah and elisha living under the rule of ahab and jezebel who were the ones that had the fancy donkeys in the land who were the ones that when they pulled up their little donkey said mercedes on the back end it was the prophets of Baal. Elijah had this unusual donkey. It was a donkey that still had pinto on the back of it. <laughs> Come on. We have become so worldly that we don't even know what true spirituality is. It can't be found in finances. Now, it doesn't mean that you can't have finances and be spiritual. But you don't point to those finances and say, here's why I'm spiritual. You point to within, things money can't buy. And say, here is who I really am. Those things can come and they can go, but they don't change me. But we're the Laodicean church, and as long as the money keeps rolling, we don't realize we're in bondage. Yet let me tell you something. Mary and I hear from people all over the world, and I mean it's a constant thing. And any time that I talk to other people that do what we do, it is a constant thing. I'm in bondage. I'm in bondage. I'm in bondage. I'm in bondage. You know, there used to be a time, I remember back when they, you know, they had the full gospel businessmen and, and all these different things going in the 70s and the 80s. And so all these Christians 
would go overseas. And the same thing even Lester Summerall, he'd go overseas and there was a need for something called deliverance. Because you go overseas in these pagan nations that had pagan cultures and they had demons hanging out their ears. And so little Christians, once they get out of their own country, this, this is what you find in the full gospel businessman thing, they get out of the country and they start praying for people that have never heard the gospel, that don't have Laodicea to lay back on. Miracles start happening and they start casting out all these demons. And even Lester Summerall, what made him famous as, as, or caused his notoriety was things he did in the Philippines, things he did with casting out demons outside the U.S. Right now, most deliverance ministries, true deliverance ministries, the waiting lists are six or seven months in America for Americans. Why? Laodiceanism has caused us to trust in riches, and we're not walking with God. And as long as the money flows, we, we found this in the 90s in America, as long as money was good, it doesn't matter what our leaders do. They don't have to have morality as long as the money flows. We just, we just start up websites called moveon.com. Move on down a little bit further into Laodicea. I mean, no, that's not good. So what we have found ourselves is we have Christians that by the way that we have taught the word, or the very lack of the word, because there's very little word being preached today. There's no responsibility before Christ. The cross isn't preached anymore. The blood of Jesus isn't preached anymore. And I guarantee you the commandments of God aren't hardly preached anymore. They're just told that Je I've had people write me and say, Jesus conquered Moses. And I'm thinking, did your mama drop you when you were little? You go to the book of Revelation, the end of the book, and they're singing about Moses and Jesus together. It's a duet. In fact, Moses says when the Messiah comes, he's going to look just like me. So now you're telling me that Jesus came and destroyed the Old Testament perfect example of who he was supposed to be. One listened to God and gave the law. Jesus came and set us free of sin and, and allowed his spirit to move in us so that we could live what he gave Moses. Because it's not just Israel, it's not being a Jew, it is being a citizen of the kingdom of the king that came and made us a vassal people. Oh man. Once you start seeing the word, and you start seeing the word in kingdom, everything changes. Most of churchianity becomes Babylonianity. Because you realize you're in bondage. And it's a time to return to the word of God. Guys, in our day, where we have more word than you can shake a stick at, we're more ignorant of the word, and what is going over many of the airwaves is not word. It is Babylon with a verse wrapped around it, taken out of context. In fact, let me tell you something. If a preacher says he can preach the New Testament without the Old Testament, what he has done, he has taken the entire New Testament out of context. You cannot have the New Testament in context without a thorough understanding of the Old Testament. It is impossible. And so we're in need of judges more than ever before. Guys, God is getting ready. This, this is where we're headed prophetically. We have got to go through the book of Judges to get to the book of Acts. Come on. We have allowed the Luciferian elite to move us so far away from God's word, His covenant, that God has lifted his hand of protection. And there are some people saying that's all there is to judgment. No, there is also the fist of Almighty God. And we're getting ready to feel it in all, in all kinds of places around the world. In fact, I was listening to uh, Rick Wiles. Him and, and uh, Steve Quayle were talking. And there's a photograph. I think it was over the U Ukraine. And, it's, and you can see it clearly in the clouds. It is an arm of fire and a fist of fire coming down in the clouds as judgment. I don't know, but there's signs and wonders that make you wake up. 
we have people going around teaching that the only kind of judgment of God is him removing his hand. So you tell me that God had his hand of protection on Egypt? Are you telling me God had his hand of protection on Babylon? Judgment phase one. God lifts his hand. Have I got your attention? No. Because like you see over and over again, the judges, the ites come in and begin to rule over you. Now that, that's where we're at. We're at this place here before this hand. Because, you know, how many know a covering hand does like this? Then it's withdrawn. Then it goes like this. And then it goes like this. In fact, the Bible even talks about the hammer of God and his judgment, like a gavel. I judge you. You don't want to ever be there. What we need to do is at least be as smart as those in the book of Judges. God lifts his hand. They get in bondage and they start crying out. Whenever they would cry out, and this is a principle that we see, you had the children of Israel in bondage in Egypt for 400 years. They started crying out because of the weight of the bondage, and there was a baby born named Moses. It's when you begin crying out because of the bondage, God can send a judge to judge the evil and to set you free. And in His grace, He will always do that before the hammer comes down. And, what did, and in the book of Judges, we see judgment. When the hammer came down, it was on the one who brought the bondage. It was on the paganism. It was on the Luciferian ruler. It was spot judgment on the elite that enslaved God's people. But the only way to get there is you got to start crying out. Let me tell you something. A lot of people right now are crying out in America. A lot of people right now are crying out in Europe. A lot of people around the world are beginning to cry out. What the devil meant for bad could end up being the last great revival that we have on planet Earth before Jesus comes back. But to get to that book of Acts, we have got to have the judges raise up. Now here's some things that God has, has shown both of us is that God is going to raise up true apostles and prophets. Now let me tell you something. If a guy comes up to you and has to hand you a business card or a ministry pamphlet that says he's a prophet or an, or an apostle, don't even go there, okay? If, it's like, you know, I have people tell me, you know, show me the credentials of those who graduate from biblical life. And I say, forget the transcripts, forget the diploma on the wall, get the guy up and let him open his mouth. If he does not have the tongue of the learned, the book of Malachi, in the mouth of the priest should be the tongue of the learned, that he knows Scripture, that he can expound the holiness of God, the nature of God, the reality of the cross. If he can't preach the word like a mad fool, then I should have never have graduated him. And that is the documentation of who he is, not some transcript somewhere. Because I've seen guys with transcripts this long from prestigious schools that could not preach their way out of a wet paper sack and most of the time we're telling people the word of god's not true the word of god's not true here the word of god's not true here you're a graduate of babylon university but i'm talking about true apostles and prophets that god is going to begin raising them up with this apostolic judge anointing that they're going to be going places and speaking forth judgment on the things that are holding God's people back. They may speak judgment on Wall Street. They may speak judgment to political movements. They may speak judgment to financial empires. They may speak judgment, and we're going to watch God absolutely destroy those things. But why is this so crucial in this day? You can't get free when you're under mind control. You can't get free when you're under mind control these are some of the things i believe that as god raises up his judges in these last days that as they go forth and see what's interesting if you have judges beginning to judge the mind control 
things really start getting screwy as far as the elites. All, all of a sudden, the triggers don't work. The frequencies don't work. All these, and all of a sudden, people start waking up. It's not doing it one at a time. They speak judgment over the system, and the system collapses. We have to have that system collapse for the sake of the remnant, for the remnant to get free and become, becoming, so they can become that in-day church who becomes the bride without spot and wrinkle. You see, this far along, and when I look at the dedication and the devotion of men of God during the Reformation, let's just go back as far as the Reformation. The best of us can't hold a candle to them. The devoutness that they had, the level of knowledge that they had of the Word of God. We've got to return to that, but we've got to bring the mind control down to do it. They're also going to see that the Ahab spirit is broken for a season. Now, every one of these gods says, mind control will be broken for a season. The Ahab spirit will be broken for a season. The Jezebel spirit will be broken for a season. Mystery Babylon's power will be broken for a season where believers are crying out. And when you get that freedom, you press into God, you establish the ways of God, you begin working with the servants of God to get you founded in this thing, to become that bride without spot and a wrinkle, so that when it goes back up, and it will go back up. Have you read the book of Revelation? It will go back up. It won't have you. You'll be on the outside looking in. That's the way to be. Even the rabbis knew enough that when, they established, when Ezra and Nehemiah established the, syn the synagogal system while in Babylon, they always moved outside the city to build their meeting places. Because it always, we're not a part of that. We're separated from it and wouldn't be a part of it. Those, when all this comes down, as God begins to move, that do what, the, what they did in the day of Judges, just go back to life as normal. We need to understand you've never had normal until you got set free. So why are you letting the bondage of the past become your normal? We have, our, our normal is what we see in the book of Acts. Our normal is our freedom in Christ to walk in the ways of God, to commune with God, and to walk in the commandments of God by the power of the Holy Spirit and to be free from demonic influence and learn to be soldiers that start bringing down strongholds instead of constantly handing devils new bricks to build up new ones in our lives. It's going to be for a season. How long that season is, I don't know. One, two, three, five. I like it for at least to be a few years. Because it's like once everybody gets free, well, we're, that, that's why we have to have the communication center. You don't know how much I'm enjoying what we're, what kind of where I'm at right now when, because I have this reservoir of teachings that we've been doing over the last 10 years, and I constantly get emails. What do I do about this? Go back to this series. Already been there, done that, taught that, posted, you know. Where all I got to do is say, here, it's already there. Listen to this series. Listen to this series. Go get this book. It's already there. Instead of me running like a chicken with my head cut off trying to produce the materials, God in his wisdom allowed me to produce a lot of the materials before he brought me in on the public stage. I mean, the wisdom of God. Now, I'm still busy doing a lot of new things that God's saying, but at least I have enough that can get a lot of people found it. We're going to get busy. That's why we have to get free we have, to get, we have to get the things of Babylon off of us. We have to renew our minds to the Word of God and to get this paradigm right. Don't let Laodicean University teach you how to minister. It better be the Holy Spirit, and it better be from the Word of God, and it better take the full counsel of God's Word from Genesis to Revelation. Jesus is in perfect harmony with Moses. I don't see how you can say that, Brother Mike, because Jesus is the one who told him to write the Torah and then dictated it to him. Come on now. If you say Jesus is a different God than the Old Testament God, then you have more than one God, and you're not walking in Christianity. You're still thinking as a, as a neo-pagan. The God of the Old Testament is warring the God of the New Testament, and Jesus conquered Yahweh. That's what's being taught today. 
Moses wasn't enough. He's, he's now conquered Yahweh. There is an entire Pentecostal movement teaching that not knowing Yah in, in, in the name yod heh vav -Hey, you can, you can cause it to spell Jesus because it literally means the God with the nailed hand shall be revealed twice. Almighty God came and took flesh. Now see, here's the exciting part. Now, no, let me, I, want to, I want to get to the good part, but I've got, to, I've got to share this. Those that grasp their season of freedom and establish the kingdom of God and the absolute rulership of Jesus will stay free the rest of their lives regardless of what happens around them. But those that get free and return to their former ways like they did in the book of Judges will soon find themselves under the heel of the Antichrist. This is the last call for freedom in the days that we have ahead of us. Now I'm going to get to the good part. I want to show you the wisdom of God here. Now the Judges is a good thing, isn't it? It's a good thing. God knows human nature. He said, I'm going to be a theocracy. I'm going to rule from heaven. I'm going to be your king. You're going to be a vassal nation, a peculiar people unto me. That's what a king would call his vassal nations that were precious to him. They were a peculiar, a set apart for the king nation. But your human nature is, I want somebody physically sitting on the throne. Now, this will help explain part of the reason for the incarnation. Almighty God says, you want a physical king? I'll become a man. Jesus came as a judge. Now, he didn't come to judge humanity the first time around. He came to judge the devil. He said he's judged already. And what you see many times in the judges is the judge would go and kill the oppressor. And so that's what the devil was expecting. Jesus messed them all up because Jesus allowed the oppressor to kill him. And after he killed him, he showed up in hell and said, gotcha. Oh, if you could see when the Spirit is there, we're leading him to the cross, and he was bearing my, our sins upon him. There was a part of him saying, Go ahead, make my day. Because he showed up in hell, and Jesus did not suffer one millisecond in hell. The moment he went down to the lower parts of Sheol, his suffering was over, and the devil's suffering began. The Bible says, in the book of Ephesians, that he triumphed over the devil, making an open show. He beat him up and dragged him through the places of hell, shaking some keys in his hand. And then it says that he went over and preached to those in, cap in captivity, those in the upper bosom of Abraham. He went and preached to them what he did, and it took so long because I really think that that beating of the devil took about a half hour at the most. And then he went over and preached for a couple of days. And all of a sudden, God's alarm clock went off and said, Okay, you have fulfilled the sign of Jonah. You've been in the belly for three days. And when he resurrected, not only did he take the keys with him, he took every saint that resided in the bosom of Abraham. Today, the bosom of Abraham is empty. The apostle Paul can say to be absent from the body is to be with the Lord. And he is going to come back one day. And I think it's pretty quick. I think I'm going to see it in my lifetime and I'm getting a little old. I'm starting to see the gray on the roof, you know what I mean? as well as some of the shutters and stuff are starting to creak quite a bit, and the hinges are starting to creak quite a bit, and EWD-40. But God keeps on telling me, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see, I'm going to see. But we don't understand the provision that God made because they wanted an earthly king. He said, I'm going to fulfill, because among their brethren of the tribe of Judah, of the lineage of David, he rose up a brother 
called himself, who is the lion of the tribe of Judah. And what I'm looking forward to is the day that Jesus of Nazareth returns and begins ruling and reigning in Jerusalem. And let me tell you something, from that day forward, from that day, now it won't be until that day, but from that day forward, there will not be uttered on planet earth, there was no king, so they did what they wanted. <laughs> no, you have to answer to the king. And for those that don't think they have to keep the feasts, in those days, if you do not go up and honor the king during the Feast of Tabernacles, the, that entire next year, your nation has no reign. Selah. Set then one of the things that make you go, hmm, why? Why tabernacles? All the other ones have been fulfilled. And now God is tabernacling among his people. You see, not only was the Mishkan of Moses a reflection of you and I, and that through the new birth, the throne of God is established on the inside of our heart and the Holy Spirit fills our heart. It was a manifestation or a type and shadow of himself because the, uh, the, the tent was made out of badger skin. It was made out of flesh. And he said, one day I'm going to take flesh and I'm going to dwell among you. And my throne is going to be established. Isaiah says that when he comes and when he sits on the throne, that God's instruction, God's Torah will flow like a river from his throne into the earth. So guys, if that's where we're headed, how about making him king now? You see, we, we, we've lost this somewhere. In, in the New Testament, when they said that Jesus is Lord, you know, the book of Romans, you know, the, the, the Roman step to salvation, if you believe in your heart and confess that Jesus is Lord, we don't even know what that means anymore. First of all, that was encoding in that because the only one that a Jew would refer to as Lord is yod heh vav -Hey. In fact, by the time of the Apostle Paul, they would not even say Yahweh or the Tetragrammaton. They would refer to him as Adonai. Now they've gone so far, they don't even say that. They just say Hashem, which means the name. But back then, when, when a Jew said Adonai, he was speaking of yod heh vav -Hey. And the Apostle Paul said, if you confess that Jesus is yod heh vav -Hey, you'll be saved. But it also meant absolute surrender to the king. That's the only way that you can come into a kingdom is you have to have absolute surrender to that kingdom, its rules, its regulations, its law, and its ruler. It's no longer what I want, it's what the king wants. It's no longer what I decree, it's what the king has decreed. But in modern Christianity, we have no king. And therefore, it can be whatever I decree. What a travesty. What a horrible travesty. Preachers should be getting in the pulpit and say, Thus saith the king in his word. Have you obeyed the king today? Have you obeyed the king this week? Are you about your father's business? Or are you too busy doing your own? See, we're getting ready. We're entering into such a pivotal time prophetically, I believe. And as God raises up these judges and you get free, press into God, press into the word, don't just think now you can go back and live your old life in an easy chair without torment. Because one, if you do that, one day you'll be receiving a mark and you will be hailing the Antichrist as Messiah. Because that's where all the bondage is leading. May it not be so to anyone that hears the sound of my voice. May we be, may we have the same cry as many of the early Christians in America in the founding of this nation. We will have no king but Jesus. Then that means you've got to get off your throne. You've got to abdicate the throne and give it to Jesus. 
Father God, we just thank you for the word today. Father, I ask that you would cause judges to raise up in the land and, Father, begin to speak your divine judgment over the very things that keep us in bondage. And, Father, let us be content with your battlefield. Let us be content with your judgments. Let us not question your judgments because only you know the heart of men. But, Father, as we see them, we will be humbled and we will submit to you. And as you free us, we will run to Jesus and run to your word and be established in our faith like never before. And Father, we just thank you. We praise you for it in Jesus' name.